want to welcome you to our journey today in the book of Hebrews. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the blessing of your presence, and may you continue to strengthen us and embolden us in service to you because of what you've done for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are really deep into our tour, very brief tour of the book of Hebrews. We've not gotten in a lot of, we haven't gone verse by verse throughout the entirety of the passage, and so I trust that you've been reading along with my handout that I provided for you, so you can read and at least figure out where you're at, because Hebrews is a really complex, very deep, very rich argument, and you really risk misunderstanding something when you take it out of context. So I want to make sure we keep this into context. Of course, the author's argument all along has been why Jesus is distinguished from the priests who offer sacrifice day by day in the temple and why he is the one and done. He's the last. He's the only one that we need to turn to. And why this is important is because, remember, he's arguing to Jews. This book is written to Jews who were starting to wonder if this Jesus were all worthwhile after all. Because once they committed themselves that this Jesus is the Messiah, the one that has been promised, the one who ultimately fulfills God's plan for us, the concern becomes all their family members start to excommunicate them. They are no longer welcome. Their businesses are no longer patronized. Uh, they are starting to struggle because, again, there's persecution for Jews who have committed themselves to Jesus Christ. This is the primary persecution that the Christian church faced at that time. I know you often think it's Rome and Nero and uh, being thrown to the lion's den. No, the greatest persecution that the church faced did not come from Rome. It came from other Jews because they considered Christianity a sect of their faith. And they excommunicated anybody from their families and great persecution. So they started wondering, is this worthwhile? Can I just go back to my faith the way I used to follow it? And, and, and the author continues to argue, don't do that. Because again, he is the one and only one. There is not going to be another. Stop waiting for somebody else like Jesus is just another priest or another person in a long line of priests who've come before. No, he is the priest who reconciles relationship with God. And so we continue with that uh, part of the passage. Remember, he's encouraging the Jews who have committed themselves to Christ, stay faithful, prevail through all this persecution, because Jesus isn't just another priest. He is the one and only one. And so once again, we continue that theme with this passage here today, chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. Every priest stands day by day, at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sin. So he's going to set up a contrast for us today. The contrast, of course, is between your priest and Jesus. Jesus is a priest, but he is not a priest. He is the priest. Priest, and these guys are just pretenders, okay? Now, to be frank, he's not really diminishing the service of the priest. The priest had an important role before Jesus. They reminded us of our desperate need for God and depending upon and trusting God because we, they always knew, the Jews always knew, sacrificing, sacrificing animals never, ever brought forgiveness of sin. I don't care how many turtle doves or how many pure and perfect lambs that you offered at the altar. It doesn't matter. It's just a placeholder that reminds us that sin is so serious that it takes a life. It destroys. But that sacrifice of that lamb never bought them forgiveness of sin. Ever. And so he says they keep doing this over and over again. It's kind of like, remember that Sisyphus, uh, one of the great heroes in Greek tragedy here, and the um, uh, story of Sisyphus and how he would, uh, uh, here he was in, in Hades after, of course, having such a heroic life. And he was destined, basically, to roll this rock every single day up to the top of a hill, and every single day it would roll back down. 
and the next day he would roll it back up. He did this over and over again. He never got the rock up to the top of the hill and over the other side. It was just a continuous thing. Now, <laughs> uh, there is actually an interpretation of this. This is actually a very hopeful story, not a depressing story. He has hope. Why would Sisyphus keep rolling this rock up the hill? Because he trusts that someday he's going to get that rock over top of the hill. But he never does. Okay, he never does. And so that's kind of what these priests do. They keep rolling the rock all the way up to the top of the hill, hoping that they'll get forgiveness of sin. And it never happens. But in Jesus, it does. This is where the hope is. Not in what the priests do. They're never going to get that rock over the hill. It's going to continually roll down. And so he's saying, put your trust in Jesus. And then he goes on, verse 12. But when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Well, that's verse 12. So Jesus, again, is the one who finally pushes that rock over the hill. Nobody else was able to do that. Nothing else can do it. Only Jesus can. And once he does demonstrate that he's done, the act is done. The rock is over the hill. He sits down at the right hand. And I love this. So what does that mean? Jesus is the, uh, again, he is the priest, the high priest. He is the sacrifice. Paul, or, uh, the author is uh, argued, I almost said Paul, again, remember, we don't know who wrote this book, it most certainly was not Paul, it was just one of those traditions that continued on for, uh, that we've heard so many times, and we say, oh, Paul wrote the book, no, Paul did not write Hebrews, we don't know who did, but he, Jesus is the high priest, Jesus is the sacrifice, but one more thing here, again, when we look at verse 12, when Christ offered, he sat down at the right hand of God. He is the authority of God. The one who sits at the right hand, the right hand man, the authority of God. He brings with him God's authority. So, why is that important? Because remember, we're talking about forgiveness of sin. These guys couldn't do it. Jesus is the authority of God. When he gives to you forgiveness of sin, it is Done. In fact, that's kind of the continuation of the theme here. We're going to see right at the end of the very last verse where he said it's you're forgiven, therefore you are forgiven because Jesus is the authority of God to forgive sin. Okay? Awesome. Verse 13. Since then he's been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. Verse 13. I love that. So, you know, you can imagine Jesus on his nice little reclining chair here. Oh, I can't even do a good recline chair. Okay, so he's got his nice little reclining chair. He's sitting on his throne. And now what is going to happen to his enemies? His enemies are going to be that little footstool. So you got Jesus. This is my Jesus. Isn't that great? His feet. Long feet. I know. Doesn't he have long feet there? That's his feet. He's resting his feet. Oh, there's his knee. There's his hands. He's drinking his little Coke. I don't know. Whatever he is. Um, so here's the thing. He's got his feet resting on the footstool. <laughs> um, now his enemies, by the way, his enemies, he's not talking about you and me and other human beings. He's talking again about, uh, he's talking about um, in, in the heavenly realm. He's talking about the transcendent realm. So we're talking about those principalities that defy God are eventually going to be subjected to the point where they're under his feet. Okay, it's kind of an awesome image there uh, in, in verse 13. That, you know what, here they are. Even the authorities that defy God are eventually going to be for his comfort. Okay, he's going he's gonna to make something comfortable, a nice piece of furniture out of them. All right. For by a single, verse 14, for by a single offering he's perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Okay, I'm a little concerned about this verse because it's very easy to misinterpret this. There's two words. We as a church turn into work in some way. So he has perfected. So for us, this is something, it's a passive thing. It's something that's done to us. Jesus does this to us. 
It's not something we do to ourselves. I don't become perfect by my activity and by what I do. But I need you to understand what this word perfected means. Perfected does not mean I do everything without fault. Perfected means is that I have been brought into relationship with God. See, here we are, you know, if we're thinking of this in terms of a linear thing, you know, I, me, I'm here in terms of my relationship with God. Now I'm here in my relationship with God, at one with God. That's what it means to be perfected. It means that that thing that was so far away, that rock at the top of the hill, which represents finally going over the hill, that now we are in relationship with God and we're forgiven. This is what this is talking about. We're perfected. We are now forgiven because of what Jesus has done. It is a passive thing for us. It is something done to us. It's not something we do. You don't become perfect in your actions. You are perfect in your relationship with God because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so that's that brings up this other word. For by single offering, he's perfected, he's brought into relationship with God. Once and for all time, those who are sanctified. Again, we make this into a work as though sanctification is something that we do. You know, it reminds me of, uh, this is maybe an apocryphal story. I heard this at the school that I went to at Houghton College at Wesleyan School. And of course, they're all about sanctification, John Wesley and and so forth. And there was supposedly, I really doubt that this is true, but supposedly a professor stood up one time and said, I am perfectly sanctified. I have not sinned in 30 years. <laughs> to which, you know, somebody quick, well, there's your first sin. <laughs> okay. Um, so we make it into this work as a sanctification, something is done. So remember, perfection is something done by Jesus to us. Jesus brings us into relationship with God. That's what he's referring to. Sanctification means to be set apart. Um, you know, it's like me choosing the shirt that I wore today. It's a bicycling jersey. I don't know. I, I will, you probably can't see it and print it on there. It's probably too faded out for you to be able to see it online, but that's what it is. It's about, and it's a great day. It's a beautiful day. I chose this shirt to wear today because it makes me feel good. It's a comfortable shirt and blah, blah, blah. Now, there's nothing, you know, this shirt didn't earn it. It didn't deserve it. I have lots of other shirts at home that I could have picked and put on. I chose this one. So again, when we talk about sanctification, uh, I'm the shirt. I didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose me. So sanctification is about me being set apart by God's choice. And now I'm in perfect relationship with God. So don't make works out of the activity of God on your behalf. We are perfected. We are set apart by God for God's purposes and now brought into a perfect relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. Okay? Not what you've done, what Jesus has done. And we go on. Verse 15. So the Holy Spirit also testifies for us. I love this. The Holy Spirit testifies for us. He's our PR department. Isn't that a great PR department? It's the greatest PR department money could buy, except for the fact you can't buy it. It's a free gift because, after all, you're set apart. This is part of the deal. You get the best PR department in the world with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what is he testifying? What is he doing on your behalf? He's reminding us, verse, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts. I will write it on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and the lawless deeds no more. Kind of goes back to this. Where it is. So in case you take this out of context, this is what happens. People take this out of context and think of perfection and sanctification as a work that we do. No, the author reminds us through the Holy Spirit that this is something that God has done on our behalf. He's the one that remembers our sin no more, who forgets it. It's no, we still committed it. We still divided people with our sin. We still wrecked the world, but God has forgiven it. 
it's gone because of what he's done on our behalf. Okay, so it's nothing we've done. It's a free gift of God, and this is what the Holy Spirit wants to remind you. It's not about what you do. It's about what's been done for you. I will remember your lawless deeds no more. Verse 18, and remember this ties it in with that forgiveness that we mentioned at the beginning. Where there is forgiveness, there is no longer any offering for sin. Ritual is gone. The ritual of reminding you how destructive sin is, of sacrificing an animal to remind you how serious sin is. Well, sin is gone. You're forgiven. You're perfected because of what Jesus has done. We now have relationship with God. We are set apart for this purpose. So why would you turn back? Do you see the argument now of the author of Hebrews? Why would you turn back to Judaism that doesn't celebrate that perfected relationship with God. Why would you go back to something that's incomplete, to a, a, a religion that is Sisyphus, continuing to push that ball up the, uh, the hill, but it never quite makes it to the top and it always rolls back down? Why would you follow something like that when we've got the real deal in Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the reminder. These great stories, the mythological stories like Sisyphus that have been passed on to us by the Greeks. What a fantastic story. But it is certainly a good illustration, a reminder to us of, of why you are so much more important. <laughs> because we don't have that despair of every single day going through the same behavior and never seeing anything change. We have a fulfillment of our relationship with God and Jesus Christ. We are now that perfection in relationship, not something we've done, but the free gift of forgiveness and restored relationship comes through Jesus. And so we give you thanks for that great high priest who by sitting on the right hand of God is the authority for God's forgiveness. We know that we are now forgiven. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to tell you, you've been set free. And so I'm asking you to go and live as though you have been set free. We ask this all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.